So next up is Sonia Lubomirsky, from, uh, professor of psychology at UC Riverside and author of the recent book, which has been widely published in many countries, The How of Happiness. Sonia. Well, thank you again. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I'm going to argue that happiness is flourishing, that it's associated with and sometimes actually leads to human flourishing. Um, uh, my name is very hard to pronounce, so I, of, I always provide a little mnemonic, Lubomirsky. It means love and peace in Russian, which I think is very appropriate for uh, uh, what I do, positive psychology. Um, so how many people here wouldn't mind being happier than they currently are? Okay, a little happier, a lot happier. And how many <laughs> have friends or colleagues or students and family members who you wouldn't mind were happier? Um, okay, well, I think that, um, you know, you're not alone. Throughout history, human beings have been infatuated with the idea of happiness and with attainment. I usually give a lot of quotes about this. Um, a couple of surveys actually have found that Americans think about happiness at least once a day. Um, so, actually, this will definitely includes all of you here today because we'll be talking about it. Um, and speaking of uh, America, of course, uh, the pursuit of happiness holds a special position um, uh, Thomas Jefferson's words in the Declaration of Independence as happiness as a cherished right that we hold, the pursuit of happiness as a cherished right. Um, and here we have our current president's sort of restatement uh, of that same um, line in the Declaration of Independence. So he, he agrees with that. Um, um, okay, but Americans aren't the only ones that are uh, infatuated with happiness. Or preoccupied with happiness. I mean, there's lots of other cultures, Asian cultures, Latin American, European cultures that you can argue are quite different from ours. Um, and and the sort of the norm of appearing happy or pursuing happy might be different in other cultures. For example, you could argue that it might be considered prideful or arrogant uh, in Eastern cultures to be seen as pursuing happiness for yourself. Um, but let's see what researchers have found. So um, here are some surveys of in different, different countries, and I just have a few as examples, Greece, Germany, South Africa, China, Korea, um, where people are asked, how important is happiness to you? And the United States, it's on a seven-point scale, so seven is the highest. Um, United States rates, uh, people in the United States rate happiness between a six and a seven um, on a seven-point scale. Um, but let's look at what the other uh, countries believe. And they basically are re extremely high as well. I mean, there are a couple of significant differences here with Germany and China, but um, but basically, in, around the world, uh, people um, report uh, that happiness is important to them. And even in cultures like, um, you know, I'm from Russia, so I know a lot about that culture. Um, there's a value to suffering that, that the Russians pe Russian people believe, and there's religious beliefs that are associated with that. But even in cultures like that, when you ask people, well, what do you want most for your children, most people say, I want my children to be happy. So I think it's a really a universal goal that that we all want to be happy. Um, we might define it differently, we might pursue it differently, but um, we're sort of in a sense everything we do in our lives is leading towards happiness. Um, but is the pursuit of happiness a worthwhile goal? You know, the title of my talk is What is Happiness Good For? In other words, is it, does it pay to be a happy person or is happiness simple hedonism? Um, and I think this is a really relevant question these days, you know, with the economy crumbling around us, with lots of challenges and threats that we're facing. Um, how can we even think about being happier? I mean, is it, isn't it a little bit um, uh, self-serving and short-sighted sort of to be talking about happiness? And, and see what you think of uh, your response after you've heard me out. Um, but I, I do, I am going to argue that it's maybe as important to look at how happy people are as it is to, to look at things like uh, the GDP of a country. Um, so just uh, quickly sort of how I got into this uh, topic, I have this frame picture, I get a lot of presents that have to do with happiness. I have this frame picture in my office and I read it a few years ago uh, and it says, a happy person promotes a happy home. A happy home promotes a happy neighborhood. Such a neighborhood affects a city which in turn inspires a state. A happy state touches a nation. A happy nation helps create a happy world. So being a happy person is the most important thing in the world. I know that's really corny and I don't usually have stuff like that in my office. but. Um, but it, it sort of inspired me to find out whether this is really true, sort of what are the benefits of happiness? I mean, does it pay to be a happy person? So along with two of my colleagues, um, Ed Diener and Laura King, we embarked on this very exhaustive systematic review of all the literature that we could find on happiness um, to address this question, which is, is the pursuit of happiness a worthwhile goal? There's, there's a citation 
for this very long paper we wrote on this, if you're interested. In other words, are there benefits to happiness or does it just feel good? Um, the final body of literature that we examined uh, were 225 papers, 283 independent samples, lots of participants. We computed 313 independent effect sizes, and effect size is a measure of the impact of a variable, the strength of the effect. So the central question really was, are happy people more successful than, the, than their less happy peers? So we had to define success, right? What is success? Well, I turned to Freud on this uh, at first. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Freud, but he you know, once said that to love and to work, and by the way, it was really hard for me to find this quote. It turns out that it actually isn't anywhere written because he said it in a conversation uh, to Carl Jung. Um, to love and to work is, is two of the things that a sort of quote unquote normal person should be able to do well. So we thought that those were two domains that, that define success, that are part of success. And then we also added health um, as a third domain. I think few people would argue about the importance of health. So the results, um, the 225 studies on the benefits of happiness um, show that, yes, indeed, happiness has, and I should say that, of course, a lot of these directions are, um, the causal direction is bi the causal arrow is bidirectional. So happiness leads to these things. These things also make people happy. But we're interested in the consequences of happiness. So happier people um, are more productive at work and more creative. They make more money and have superior jobs. For example, longitudinal studies show that if you're happy in college, you're going to make more money at age 37 and have more autonomy in your, in your jobs. Um, happier people are more creative, uh, as I mentioned, active and confident, and better negotiators. Also, happiness has a lot of uh, benefits in relationships. Happier people are more likely to marry and to have fulfilling marriages. Um, and this is in part a selection effect. So happiness at time one predicts that you will find a marriage partner at time two, maybe 5, 10, 15 years later. So it's not just that marriage makes people happy, which undoubtedly it does, at least, um, at least for a period of time. Um, <laughs> well, two, two years is the, is the finding. I, we could talk about that later. Um, uh, happy people are more likable. They have better social support. And they're healthier. They have stronger immune systems. Or they're, they even live longer. Um, and, and happy people are not more self-centered or egocentric, actually, which a lot of people believe, but they're actually more helpful and philanthropic. So um, just quickly, I just want to, you know, and they're also, I should say, very relevant in, in today's world. The happier people cope better, more resilient. Um, so just in, I, I wanted to give you a few more examples of the details of some of these studies just, just in, uh, so you don't just get this very quick overview. So, um, uh, so I just want to focus on a couple of studies that have to do with, I think, topics that I think would interest, interest people, productivity at work, creativity, and, um, and health. Um, a lot of these studies are longitudinal. Where they, they measure happiness at time one, and then they look at some kind of outcome or behavior at time two. At least with longitudinal studies, you know that the outcome or behavior at time two ha didn't cause, couldn't have caused the happiness at time one. Um, they're not perfect, of course. There's also experimental studies I'll tell you about. So um, here's one study. The sample study was done in a California city. Um, these were employees, um, mostly middle-aged men, uh, professional employees, and um, their happiness was measured at time one. And then three and a half years later, the researchers went back and they, um, they went to the supervisors or bosses of these employees, and they had them rate uh, the employees on overall work performance on, and on these four dimensions. Does this person offer useful ideas? Do they have high goals for performance? Do they pay attention to when you're talking to them? Do they work harmoniously with others uh, to achieve organizational goals? Um, and so again, this is three and a half years later. What they found is that happier people at time one were rated by supervisors as superior in all of these dimensions. Um, and you know, this applies to you too. The, the five happiest people in this room are going to be uh, more creative and more productive at work uh, three years later. So, um, and there are quite a few other studies done in lots of other workplaces that show the same effects. This is, this is just one example. Um, other researchers have approached this question um, somewhat differently, doing experimental studies. What they do is they temporarily induce happy mood. Now, happy mood is not the same as happiness, but happy mood actually tends to, uh, is, turns out to be the hallmark of happiness. Sort of the defining characteristic of a happy person is someone who experiences frequent positive emotions like interest, curiosity, affection, pride, joy, uh, those kind of things. So, uh, these kinds of experimental studies, people come into the lab and their happy mood is induced. In this particular study, people were given a package of candy and chocolate uh, in a transparent sort of uh, little package with a ribbon. 
and that works for everyone except for dieters. Um, I think they usually exclude dieters from those studies. So they induce happy mood. In this study, they, they used uh, medical doctors, internists, um, and uh, uh, they had them complete a test of creativity after the, and by the way, they also induced neutral mood. Um, and here's a test of, the test of creativity. Basically, uh, people were given a um, list of problems like these. They were given three words, and they had to come up with a fourth word that relates to these three words. This has been sort of shown to be associated with overall creativity, and we have very smart people in this room, so um, you know, can anyone tell what the answer to that question is? Night, very good. I, I, I couldn't do it, at least not in a short amount of time. So nightclub, nightgown, nightmare. So night is the answer here. Um, and there's a whole bunch of problems like this. And the, the, what the study found is that people who were put in a happy mood temporarily just by giving them some chocolate, by the way, they didn't eat the chocolate or candy. They, they set it aside, um, were more creative. They did better on these kinds of problems than those in a neutral mood. And I think that's a really neat finding. So um, quickly, I just want to say a couple of words about physical health. Lots of longitudinal studies that are done that look at, sort of measure happiness at time one and then follow them across time to see if they get sick. So people who are happy at one point in time have a lower incidence of stroke six years later. This is especially true for men. If you have coronary heart disease, you're going to be more likely to survive it up to 11 years later if you are happy at time one. Um, you're less likely to be receiving disability uh, 11 years later. You're less likely to die in a car accident years later. Actually, I think that's a really interesting finding. Um, so happier people are less likely to be in accidents, and, um, and they're less likely to die of all causes up to 28 years later. So um, uh, one of the most famous studies on longevity is called the NUN study, where these nuns were um, uh, researchers measured the positive emotions that they expressed at around age 20, 21, and then they followed them basically until death. And what they found is that the nuns who were in the bottom quartile of happiness, so the bottom quartile, um, were, had a two and a half times the risk of death as those in the top quartile, and that translated to a 6.9 year lifespan difference. So this is, again, this is uh, well-being, sort of positive emotions measured um, at a young age, predicting longevity. Um, this is one of my favorite studies of all time. Oh, uh, a little aside, one of my latest uh, kind of hobbies is to peruse the obituaries of the oldest people, and what's really nice about this hobby is that um, there, are more, there are always more obituaries of the world's oldest person because, or the country's world, because you know, once one person dies, and then the next person becomes the oldest person. So um, um, you have one on the left there, um, and so I, I basically read them for clues into personality and happiness, and so all of these uh, individuals, their family members, talked about how they're happy, they're optimistic, they thought the secret to happiness was staying positive and happy, sense of humor. So um, I thought that, it, just a little anecdotal evidence for you there. Um, so it does seem to be true that the joyfulness of a man prolongeth his days. Um, okay, so one of my favorite studies of all time um, was a laboratory, I guess you'd call it a laboratory. It's actually a hotel study because subjects stayed in a hotel, they were quarantined. Um, you have healthy volunteers, they completed a measure of, of happiness, which is basically positive emotional style, that's what they called it. Um, and then they were administered uh, uh, the cold virus through their nose, which is something you probably wouldn't have wanted to be a subject in this study. And as you all know, we're all exposed to viruses all the time, but we don't all get sick, so why is that? So um, researchers then quarantined them for five days in this hotel, um, and then they measured host resistance to the common cold, um, monitored them for one month. So, and they measured like level of mucus, the actual presence of the virus, um, you know, how many times you blow your nose, you know, really, you know, lots of measures of whether people did develop a cold. And, and this study found that happier volunteers were less likely to develop a cold. I think it's a really amazing finding. I should say that this, they controlled for things like age and body mass and ethnicity. So it wasn't the case that happier people just happened to be younger or thinner or um, whatever. And, and also that unhappiness or depression was not associated with getting cold. So it was just the happiness that was associated with getting colds. Um, Okay, so um, uh, just, uh, just summing up, um, there's lots of evidence, I think some of it is indirect, that happy people in Western societies are more successful in sort of the three domains of life that we talk, looked at, work, relationships, and health. Um, and, um, and I would argue that, you know, among ourselves, our friends and colleagues, that, that it's going to be the happiest people, um, this is sort of a strong argument, I guess, it's, the happiest people are going to be the ones who are going to change the world who are going to be the most creative, who are going to thrive and be resilient and be healthy. Um, 
And as I said before, I think it is very important to measure the happiness of societies, of individuals, um, as well as you know, looking at economic indicators. So is happiness a panacea? Um, well, absolutely not. I mean, that would be absurd to say that. I, my argument is much more modest. I think that happiness is a strength, but it's one strength among many um, that, that leads to success. Um, so this is a nice quote from Bertrand Russell um, that I just had up there. So um, now I hope you're all convinced that being happier is a good thing. So if ha being happy is such a good thing, how can you become happier? I mean, is it even possible to become happier given the ge behavior genetics evidence? And if it's possible to become happier, is it possible to sustain that? Well, I, I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, to, uh, so I just leave you with a quote from Aristotle, and you have to read my book for the answer to the how to become happier question. So thank you.